Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Flamingo Sundays podcast. Today we're sitting in someone else's studio and it's probably a little bit more flash than the studio we're used to. We're usually about just going on the hop and um, just setting up wherever we can. But mate, uh, we've been welcomed into a very flash, very new Shaw Financial podcast studio. I'm sitting here with uh, that self-proclaimed big dog. <laughs> <laughs> The, Theo the pod, Chambers. The podcast studio actually hasn't got too much use yet, so I'm glad we're in here. <laughs> Mate, it's flash. It's very, very good. And, and I was in here a week ago or, or two weeks ago looking at the, the brand new fit out, mate. It's a very, very nice office, incredible views. Very yep. easy to get motivated to come come in and not work from home if you've got an office like this. That was the aim. Yeah, definitely through COVID, everybody wanted to work from home. So I was like, we have to make a new office and entice people in. You've done, you've done a job. You enticed us to you. So yeah. you've, you've done well. Yeah, we made you ditch your podcast room. <laughs> Mate, um, for, for the few people who listen to my podcast who probably don't know who you are, there wouldn't be too many. You're, you're um, you know, a pretty big deal in the finance space. and and it, you, mate. And I, I only found out a few days ago that you're a pretty big deal in the wakeboarding scene as well. <laughs> <laughs> Not quite, but yeah. Spent some time on the river growing up, yeah. Mate, let's, um, let's take it back to, to young Theo Chambers. Yep. Um, before you know, Shaw Financial was the largest independent brokerage in Australia. Yeah, run us run us through the the young days and and how we come to be sitting here today. Well, it probably all goes back to like um, you know when I was a nineteen year old knocking on doors selling Foxtel. That's how I ended up as a as a mortgage broker. Actually, I knocked on some guy's door who was the uh, head of retail or head of uh, area manager, I think it was, of CBA um, for New South Wales, something like that. And he offered me a job um, to work in, in ComBank in the branch. And at the time, I was actually like, that's not cool, like banking. I, I, I don't want to work in a branch. Um, and then I thought, you know, why not? I was at uni. I was like, yeah, I could probably do it part-time, three, four days a week. Um, got into to banking. I wanted to be the branch manager because I thought that was the big dog role. Um, <laughs> and um, then someone said that, you know, the, the home loan specialist actually earns more than the branch manager. I was like, well, maybe I should be the home loan specialist. Um, and yeah, I was there for a few years. Didn't quite um, hit my straps. You know, wasn't quite earning the, the, the potential I felt like I could have got to. So, and ironically, actually what happened was I bought my first property back then and I got my own mortgage through a mortgage broker, even though I was a home loan specialist at ComBank. I was like, something's wrong here. So uh, that broker offered me a job. Um, that was, then the rest was history. I started working with him, which was at uh, McGrath's uh, in-house finance business, Oxygen Home Loans. Mm-hmm. And that's how we sort of started um, uh, targeting real estate agents because I started in a real estate business understood um, how you know real estate agents operate and how we could integrate our services into um, real estate businesses in a way that complements their day-to-day uh, I was there for a couple of years you know we, we sort of climbed to the top there a few of us were doing 70 uh, percent of the volume three of us were doing 70 percent of the volume of you know 30 brokers so we tried negotiating negotiating with John John McGrath for a piece of the business uh, that didn't turn out too well so then we left and rest is history. We started Shaw Financial. And, and how many years on are we now in, in Shaw? That would have been 2012, but we started in 2013. So we're coming up to our 10 year anniversary soon. We'll, we'll be having a party. Hope you can make it. Looking forward <laughs> to it. Hopefully I'm not sober at that time. <laughs> um, so mate, 19 years old, knocking Foxtel. I, uh, I'm sure you didn't see yourself doing that forever. You know, there's a lot of my listeners are young and, and, and a lot of my staff have, have been selling uh, solar panels in the past, knocking on doors selling solar panels, and that's how they get into real estate. I, I have to say though, the door knocking was some of my best experience. You know, you you're knocking on you know countless doors, getting rejected nonstop. You know, mm-hmm. I was saying um, just the other day, I think it's between 100 to 150 doors a day we were knocking on, um, knocking on from 3 4 p.m. till 8 p.m. I think it's illegal to knock on someone's door after eight o'clock at night, um, and a good day would be three or four sales. So that's like a lot of rejection. That's like 98% of people saying, get lost, mate. Not um, interested. Yeah. That was before Netflix is around as well, right? Yeah. <laughs> the, the, the awkward part was the two people that, the, the two or three people that might say yes, then you'd say, can I borrow your toilet as well? After? <laughs> because I've been walking around all day and I really need to go. <laughs> yeah. So it was a, uh, 
about about a four percent conversion or a three percent conversion rate on, on on all the knocks. Yeah, probably about probably two to three percent. Yeah. And uh, did you leave school? Were you doing it during school? No, no, that was um, sort of first year out of school. I went mm-hmm. travelling for a few months um, overseas in Europe. I met some guy over there um, who was a, a few years older than me, and he was living like a rock star over there. And I was like. Well, how, what do you do? And he told me that he worked for this uh, sales company and the sales companies who had the contract with Foxtel, but they had multiple contracts. He hooked me up with a job when I got back and I was just there for about six to nine months. I loved it at the time because I got a, after like a month or so, I became a team leader, team leader and I got a um, company car, which is one of those 12-seater high ace vans. <laughs> the typical door knocker bus. I thought I was <laughs> killing it in that van. I was like, all oh, my mates. Do you have a fuel card? I didn't get a fuel card, unfortunately. No, I had to pay for my petrol, but um, I could pick up all my mates and go down the beach. Didn't really do that often, but still, the idea was cool. <laughs> <laughs> and and when you were growing up, you know, you had a family of people who had successful businesses that built successful mm. businesses, didn't have successful businesses. Yeah, family of business owners, definitely, yeah. So when you were growing up, was was starting a business and and becoming a business owner something that you always aspire to do, or? Were you quite lost with knowing what you, you wanted to do when you were coming? Yeah, 100%. Up? I, I did have a bit of pressure because I come from a very um, intense Greek family. They put a lot of pressure on you growing up. And um, I, I didn't want to join the family business, but I, I wanted to, to prove I'm not a delinquent, you know, because I was a bit of a naughty boy growing up. Um, so I wanted to right my wrongs. Um, I, I didn't know what, what, what I wanted to do. I'll tell you, I'm actually, a great pivotal part about, you know, figuring out what I wanted to do in life at a, as a teenager, at the age of, say, 19, let's say. I, I remember everybody, when you finish school, everyone was like, you've got to find something that you're passionate about. You know, you're only going to be su- successful at something that you're passionate about. And I was like scratching my head going, well, what the hell am I passionate about? You know, and I think I was, I just started maybe working at ComBank at the time. I'm like, I'm not really passionate about banking. Like, what the hell? And I, I, I was in... The, my dad's high ace. He's also got a cool high ace. <laughs> I was in my dad's car with him. He said he's in. Um, my dad's a liquor retailer, and I know my dad doesn't love his wine or anything. You know, he he, he um, drinks the cheap cask wine. He, lo- he likes the um, the clean skins. And I was like, <laughs> I was like, Dad, you know, um, everyone says you got to be passionate about what you do to to be successful at it. You're successful at what you do, but you don't. You're not passionate about wine, like you know. And he goes. And his, and his thick Greek ac- accent is like, Theodor, I'm not passionate about wine, but I'm passionate about trying to make a business work out of it. And that was like a turning point. I was like, okay, so you don't need to be passionate about what, what industry you're in. You need to be passionate about trying to make a project success, successful out of it. And that's sort of what I did with home loans. You know, like I love property more than home loans. Mm. That's probably where the passion comes from. And I love trying to make a business out of it too. And that's, that's where it grew from. Mm. When, when you moved from... The uh, the number one again proclaims big dog spot at Foxtel, <laughs> handed back the high ace keys and yeah. I moved. was never handing those keys back. <laughs> I was really upset about that. And you moved into to CBA at that point in time. Did did you have a vision for you know you know creating a brokerage, creating a business, or were you really just moving through the motions? Because I know a lot of young people are that's something that they struggle with, right? They they. You can reflect back now and say, oh, that was great because I moved through there. I learned that. I jumped into that. I learned that. And then, you know, it all led me to where I am right now. But when you're in the moment, it's very hard to to know whether or not you're on the right track or whether or not you're doing the right thing. I think you're only going to achieve what you believe is possible, right? So from a young age, I always had high expectations of myself. I always wanted more. I was always running a million miles an hour. I was always biting off more than I could chew. You know, I was always trying. And I always had high hopes, you know, like even when things are going great at, at you know, the, my um, previous employer, the uh, Oxygen Home Loans, I, I, I wasn't quite satisfied, you know. I was like, all right, now we're going to start a business we're gonna, and we're going to build a big business. It wasn't like I wanted to open a small brokerage for a few of us to share some desks and hang out, you know. I was like, no, I want to build a brand that I'm proud of and build something that's going to be, you know, something I can look back on and, and be proud that we accomplished something. So I was always quite passionate and driven and I you know, I think believing in yourself that you can achieve that is the only way to get there too you know and did you always have that growing up like were you always someone who had a strong mindset was mm, was yeah. always learning and wanting to be better or I wasn't I wouldn't say I was an academic at school I was good at um, maths and business studies right being Greek obviously maths is like uh, second nature but um 
uh, yeah, I wouldn't say I was an academic. Yeah, I, you know, I, I, I do strive to, to learn things regarding property and finance and whatnot. Love mm-hmm. that, you know. I, uh, as boring as this sounds, I, I try and learn as much about tax laws and, you know, how to minimize tax, basically. Um, and I pass on Is that. that also the Greek coming out That's also the Greek, you know. <laughs> Everything's cash. Yeah, yeah, a bit of, a bit of, a bit of cash, you could say. Um, the, yeah, I think I, I do love um, sh- absorbing that, and sort of knowledge and, and sharing that with clients, you know, on how to create wealth through property in the most tax effective manner. Um, but yeah, no, I, I think I just always to sort of back to your question, you know, was I always like that? I just always had, you know, energy and drive and I always just thought anything was possible and I didn't care about failing or making mistakes either. Made lots of mistakes. I don't regret any of the mistakes, but at least I tried, you know? Yeah. And, and the the passion for property, was that something that you had growing up, use your family, you know, hugely into property or was the property side of things because you wanted to create wealth and that's what got you into your first property at, I think, 19? Sorry, say that again. So, so, so the passion for property, yeah. obviously, like you said, you were super passionate about property, super passionate about finance and obviously yep. minimizing tax wherever you could. Was that something that was ingrained into you when you were growing up or did the passion for property and finance come from a, you know, a want to create wealth and a want to... Yeah, I... Property, once again, I keep, keep I don't want to keep saying the Greek thing, but Greeks and property, you know, yeah. and bricks and mortar, you know, you've got to you got to you got to buy um, bricks and mortar is what they always say, and and land, not not apartments, is the big Greek thing too, and you never sell, you never want to as a, as a real estate agent, you hate having a Greek vendor because they just never sell, um, but. I yeah, so I always had a passion for property because you know my family were heavily into property. Um, I, yes, at a young age, you know, when I bought that first property at, at I think it was 21 when I bought that first property, um, I was, I couldn't have, I lived there initially, room shared the other rooms out. I think I've seen you talk about doing that to get yourself in. That's exactly what I did. I, I um, rented out the other, other bedrooms and quickly realized I can't quite afford this place <laughs> and not being able to afford it actually drove me to try and figure out a way to earn more money so I could afford to live there. Because I ended up renting the property out after about six to twelve months, and I rented it for about two, three years, and I was like, I want to be able to live in that house, but I need to earn more money to be able to live in that house. What do I have to do? And I could barely live in it whilst also room sharing. So it's like, one day I need to be able to live in there and not room share. So how am I going to do that? And then you know, during it being investment property, I was constantly looking into ways with my accountant of you know how does the depreciation schedule work how does the tax work i i uh, just learned from you know actually doing my tax returns with my accountant on an annual basis on on, on all the ins and outs of you know um creating wealth through property all right so it's uh it was ingrained in mm. short yeah yeah. yeah yeah i had to hassle my accountant a lot he hates me <laughs> <laughs> i'm sure he doesn't hate you now yeah. the uh the transition then from from cba to to business owner so being an employee to essentially being self-employed was was Oxygen, like you were contracted to Oxygen, or were you still employed underneath that that entity? No, similar sort of model that we operate here. We we have um, you know uh, contractors like mm-hmm. real estate groups have. Um, they have their own sort of business within a business, so it's commission only. You, you know, you you've got to um, sink or swim, really. You know, it's it's. Um, I I like that. I thrived in that environment too personally when I first started because, you know, you you, you get out what you put in. You know, um, I, something that frustrated me back at uh, Commonwealth Bank was being on a salary, even if you hit your KPIs. I remember one time I came like second in the state for my KPIs and my bonus was 300 bucks because the branch didn't hit its targets. Yeah, and right. It's like, how's that anything to do with me? I nailed my targets, like, come on. And it was like $300 paycheck. I was like, that's almost like insulting. <laughs> you know, I've done everything you want me to do. So I didn't really quite in- enjoy that type of environment. And so also when we set up a business, I, w- I created the business for similar, the, the, the model of the business was for similar mindset people to myself that would also thrive in that environment of a commission only environment where you get out what you put in. Right. And and how did you find the transition from an employee to, to, to being a business owner or even as a contractor? You're essentially still running your own business, right? I think a lot of people struggle with taking that leap. I know a lot of young people reach out to me on socials going, oh, well, how do I make more money? How mm. do I you know, start my own business when I haven't got any backing behind me or any savings or anything like that? So what was the thing that gave you the the, the motivation or the want to, to jump out other than the $300 bonus? Yeah, well, yeah, it... We could get really deep on this because it actually the reason I left was because I, uh, 
<laughs> a girlfriend of mine actually cheered on me whilst I was away and I took an extra week off my holiday and CBA uh, um, delayed a promotion that I was hoping to get by taking that extra week. So thankfully that girl cheated on me actually. <laughs> and then, um, hindsight, huh? Yeah, hindsight. And then, so then one thing led to another, which was me, me quitting. Um, I going from a salary into a contractor role and commission only role geez did my work ethic change because back to my point about getting out what you, you put in you know at, at cba it was very tools down at 5 30 you know mm. you know as soon as the branch would close i'm waiting there for them to count the tills and i'd be sitting there just going when can i get out of here my job's done let me go you know mm. where when i went into a, a commission only environment i was staying back till seven eight o'clock most nights i was in the office first thing i was working saturdays as well i loved it you know because i was getting out what i was putting in so I'd, i was really you know um, happy to work long hours and a lot more driven because i actually felt that i'm getting rec recognition for all the, the, the work i was doing and what about was it like instant or was it you know no. six 12 18 months of like very small amounts of money and you just trusted the process over time so luckily i was young i was like 22 when i started as a broker so and like i said i moved back home because i couldn't afford to be in, in in that place i bought so i didn't have to pay rent i was living with parents um i started in january and my first com check was august and it was like four grand as well so not much over seven months <laughs> eight months um, Almost as much as three hundred bucks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Compounded. But, yeah, it paid off in the end, but it was it was pretty um, it was pretty hard staying motivated for that long without one paycheck coming in, um, and especially when at periods, the thing about broking, which is annoying, is that you can be working in, in your establishment phase in that first twelve months. You can be working so hard, and you can be doing lots of actual. Um, work in the sense of bringing in lots of clients and having a big pipeline of applications, but everybody's getting, um, you get everybody approved, but you've got to wait for them to buy property. Then you've got a six week settlement and then you get paid a month later. So I remember I was working, you know, long hours and I actually felt like I had a big deal flow and I was, you know, um, achieving my goals, but I wasn't getting paid for it because I have to wait for all these, these uh, applications and, and whatnot to turn into funded transactions. Um, and so you had to keep motivated whilst not really earning an income. It was, it was tough, but I could see the light in the end of the tunnel and, and I was loving what I was doing. And that's, I think that's a big misconception, especially in, in sectors where it's com only. Before you get into an industry, broking, real estate, you know, most sales roles, people look at the external, just like the guy that you saw over in you know, Europe who was all cashed off and mm -hmm. living the dream. But I think people misinterpret how potentially hard it can be and how long it actually takes mm. to be able to generate income, mm. which is much greater than what you could potentially earn as an employee. Because mm. um, I know a lot of people who get into the industry that I'm in, you know, they think that they can get in and you know, clients will come to them once they post mm. on Instagram and everything's going to be dandy. But the reality of, of, of the industry when people get into it, it can be very, very different if you're not built for it. Yeah, 100%. And, and, and you've got to be able to manage stress and rejection and whatnot and get through the tough times to stay motivated you know if if you know you keep getting especially in your first 12 months in your industry right um you're getting a lot of people going so who are you <laughs> how do you know that you're going to you know actually farm your property and you know yeah, i get your pitch but why am i paying you you know like it's you have to really validate yourself yeah um and same well in mortgage broking the profile doesn't really mean much as in it, it's more like admin and it's like can you go do my admin for me and find a bank that will lend me this and if you get the right answer you get the right answer they don't care if you're you know the the, the big dog as such it's just if you've got the results you've got the results but um still to try and get you know referral relationships up and running to try and get agents to trust you and and send you clients especially at the age of 21 i was like the kid in the office running around the 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 way I did it was by being the most annoying person where they're like, all right, mate, here, have a bone and leave me alone, you know? <laughs> well, let's talk about that. So for, for, for the young people who are getting started, when Theo Chambers was, was young getting started, I'm sure there was some pretty, pretty big names in the broking space. How did you, how did you start to, to build relationships now? Well, you guys have got the relationships with probably the biggest names in, in most industries. Mm. How, how did that come about other than just, you know, annoying people? Because... Well, that's probably a more methodical approach to it. <laughs> I would I would say annoying is the best best word. Yeah. <laughs> I was definitely annoying. Um, I remember I even got asked to leave open home sometimes because I'd be like asking uh, buyers what they thought thought of the property in front of other buyers at the agent. Be like, what are you doing? Get out of here! You know, like let me speak to my buyers about the property. Just just leave. Yeah. <laughs> and um, even you know, at one point an agent um, 
absolutely blew up on me. I'm not going to name his name, but um, he was he, he was the big dog of of uh, McGrath. That probably gives it away, but um, he he was like the one that it's like if you crack the relationship with him, you've made it. And um, and at his open home, I was telling telling my client who I'd already uh, um, done the finance for that the auction of of this property is you know um, going soon and that property is looking at it around the corner is in an hour so you may as well wait here and um, check out the auction and the agent blew up at me about talking about another property around the corner whilst his auction's about a kick start and he's like get out of here and never come back and so I was like a little kid and I was like oh my god I've, I've, I've upset the big dog you know? <laughs> so, so lots of things like that happened um, and then yeah once once I proved myself to these agents and they could see that I, you know, I was you know, in the office back late and um, they were asking me to basically leave because I wasn't allowed a, an alarm code to, to lock up. And they said, all right, this, this guy's clearly you know, a hard worker. I should give him some opportunity. Um, you know, then we had a bit of a, a name and reputation for ourselves, me and my business partner, Alex, and we started the business. And then we just, we had to do that whole sort of six month journey again of you know, once we started a business, it was six months again of no, no sort of income expenses going out the door no revenue coming in had to still stay focused and motivated again um and then you know within sort of 12 months we started you know um having a bit of a name for ourselves because we were being the annoying agents again probably no different uh, annoying brokers again to, to agents probably no different to, to how you would have got up and running i'm sure you would have annoyed a lot of agents heaps heaps you know and they're like posting got- content of people like who the fuck is this guy yeah you gotta be somewhat <laughs> annoying unfortunately and they're like this guy's so annoying that i just have to support him i just I'm a- if i know i give him a name and a number he'll call the name and the number you yeah 100 percent when uh when you transitioned out of uh of oxygen into shore what was was the vision to to create it to what it is right now and i'm sure even what it is right now is probably not what you want it to be it's yes. a lot of growth left right yeah spot on I'm, I'm i still feel that we've got a, a lot to do um you know we 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 really want to get into the business of actually manufacturing and home loan so our own product which is you know um funded from our own means as in um, a securitized product um but back to your question yeah i i, I did always have a a, a vision and a, a dream and a passion of of building a, a big business. I wanted it to be a brand that we were proud of, um, you know. And I had some good support. I had I had some good mentors in my life, both family and external mentors. Some of my mentors I met along the journey. So some of my um, um, you know predecessors there at, at McGrath. Um, I maintained rela- relationships with with um, Jeff Lucas. Mm-hmm. He's the ex CEO there now. Now CEO of the agency. Agency, yeah, yeah. I've got a good relationship with him. Um, you know, good relationships with people in the industry that that uh, are high up in the industry that you know practice humility in what they do as well. Um, and they they bring me back down to earth as a young kid when I thought I was invincible. And they're like, "No, nah, listen, mate, just calm down." <laughs> <laughs> and did you have many people like tell you no, or you know, I'm someone personally who shares my vision with most people who ask me, and I'm not embarrassed to do so. But most people think, "Fuck this guy's." Like smoking something you know were you similar like were you someone who when someone said oh you know what do you want to do or what are you creating you sort of talked it down or you were pretty open and saying well this is what i want to build or this is what i'm going to build i i was always you know um enthusiastic about you know building and growing the team did i have an exact idea of how i was going to do it and what it was going to look like no Mm -hmm. um i was just always trying um you know did did I sort of jump on opportunities and ask questions later? Yes. You know, did did some of those opportunities that I jumped on not turn out and then, you know, figured, hey, maybe we shouldn't go that direction and go this direction instead? Definitely, right? So, no, I didn't really have a clear um, uh, plan or idea that I was preaching to everybody. Um, I just wanted to to build a team of great people was probably um, the, the number one priority, you know, making sure that we had like-minded individuals that all were hungry and energetic and passionate about what they did. Yeah. Um, you know, there's been people um, come and go here from, from Shore Financial that if they, they they didn't have that, you could quickly tell within the first six to 12 months and it wasn't a, a point of me needing to, to, to make them um, quit or let them go. They'd, they'd take that upon themselves to realize that they're not, it's not gonna work out for them. Much easier that way. <laughs> yeah, much easier that way. <laughs> um, less legal battles too. Yeah. And. Um, yeah, look, it's just that that sink or swim uh, sort of culture as well, where, where people sort of um, either align to our our ethos or not. So, um, yeah, no, I, I don't think I needed to convince everyone in the brand of that vision. They just could see it or, or not. 
And how about being a broker first to then being a business owner? You know, I think mm. I look at a lot of, again, salespeople that have a very salespeople mentality instead of a business owner mentality. And obviously from being an individual broker to now running a, a team of, what, what's, the, what's the team size now? Uh, Not probably small. On, on shore, there's probably um, 65, close to 70 people here on shore, about close to 40 of them are brokers. We've got offshore about 30. Um, good question. I, I think it's extremely relevant, especially in broking, you know, for the, the people at the top to still maintain the frontline interaction with consumers, to stay relevant, to understand mm -hmm. the business from the, the bottom up. So um, I, I also believe that from a management point of view in, in terms of um, my management team, you know, my, my um, you know, one of my best support, Alicia Hodge. She's she's been there from the start. She started off as a, an assistant, you know, doing doing loans. Now she's head of operations, and she understands the business from the bottom up. Right? Um, yeah, I, I think also from a, a training and management point of view, from from my role and my, my business partner's role, I think it's important that you can sit down with a broker and actually relate to what challenges they're dealing with at that present time in that present marketplace. You know, so the banks constantly. You know, change their appetite, change the policy, and, and lending climates change, and being actually actually able, able to relate to what your brokers are going through by dealing with it yourself is extremely important. And do you find that you're seeing a lot of common things with the young brokers or or, or the young people that come through the organisation, and you can look at it and go, I remember when I was going through that, or you know, when they're just smashing the phone and nothing's happening, and and you can reflect back and go, yeah, that was me too. Because it's very hard, I think, for young people. When they look at someone who is successful, they go, oh, fuck, you wouldn't understand. You were never here, you know? It's exactly right, right? That's exactly the attitude sometimes you get. But that's why I haven't completely gone off the tools. I still still, you know, have my clients and I still do a bit of broking myself because there was a period where I almost was, you know, completely off the tools because I was snowed under and just managing the business. I didn't have a management team like I have now. You know, it was only me and an operations manager. Now there's, you know, five, six people in the management team. So I've got a bit more time to be able to... Uh, to, to be able to look after the clients and um in that period where I, I dropped down the the broking that was the response i got from from brokers you know i'd be saying listen just do this do that no come on you got this and they're like theo mate you've been off the tools for years you don't get it anymore like things have changed you know it's a lot harder now you know like you, you had it in the good old days <laughs> <laughs> uh, the good old days comment just really annoys me and so uh, that actually motivated me to go how hard is it let's just i'll pick up some more clients and i got my volume back up and now i can say all right you think it's hard? I managed to do X, Y, Z. I spoke to that bank and they said you could do it this way, blah, blah, blah. And it makes it a lot easier to train and manage and influence your, your team if you're actually doing it yourself and you're practicing what you preach. 100%. And what do you reckon the difference is with people like that? Because I was having a team meeting this morning with the team and, you know, one of my team was, you know, saying, oh, the market's changed and, you know, this is happening. And, and I said the same thing. It's like, oh, yeah, but how come this person you know, brought on four new clients over the last three week and bought this property. So like, how do you, or how, how, how did you go from, you know, having excuses and, and turning those excuses into results, right? Because it's the same yeah. kind of excuses and excuses results. Excuses is, is the best word for that because I, I hate people that try and use market conditions. Look, sometimes there's fair reason, you know, in, in, in real estate, you know, sometimes if you're operating in a certain marketplace and that certain, certain marketplace, has literally no stock on the market, then that is, you know, market conditions. But I think as a broker, because you're not really reliant on a specific marketplace to operate in, you can, you can, you know, do business throughout the whole of Australia now with thanks to some um, technological changes. Um, I don't think those excuses are ever valid. That's that's a character issue of someone trying to find excuses for not achieving what they what they could possibly achieve. Um, I think you know you can always point the finger and say, oh, I don't have a good support or I don't have, you know, um, good uh, relationships and partnerships. I've, you know, had a bad run or bad luck with who I've tried working with. That's just excuses. You've got to keep keep trying, you know. I, I think in my early days, I met over 100 real estate agents just to get 10 or 20 to refer, you mm. know. Um, and the other, the other 80 were the ones that probably thought I was an annoying loser. <laughs> Kicked you out of their office. Yeah, they like, get out of here, mate. <laughs> and... Um like you, you've seen it all, right? You've seen the super successful brokers, like, and you've got a you know 
Christian, like we were talking about last night, won a pretty significant award in the industry. Yeah, that made me really happy. And he Christian. started with you as well, I remember. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He's, he's, he's been here seven years. I, I really love seeing Christian win that award last night because it's really, really well deserved. It's sometimes really annoying some, uh, at some of these awards that the numbers don't always speak for themselves, as in, you know, it's sometimes how good your submission is that can get you the, the award. And so I was worried that, you know, he's had a, there's been a few people in here that have um, nominated themselves for awards and, and, and not won. And, you know, Christian really deserved to win last night. So I was, I was very happy to see that not only did he take out residential broker, but the, the final award is like um, Australian Broker of the Year, which is, you know, uh, MVP of all the winners. It's the who is the going to win the uh, winner of all the, all the winners tonight. And he took that home and it was great to see. So what do you see the difference is, though, for someone like Christian, seven years he's been here, it's obviously taken him seven years to get to that point. Mm. And there would have been other people who started in the industry at the same time, right? Mm. Similar connections, probably grew up in a similar area. Mm. What's what's the major difference? Well, see, he, you know, he's a um, Canberra boy. So growing up in the, the affluent areas or something didn't didn't give him a head start. He, he came in and he just hustled his way to the top, you know, probably the same sort of background in the sense that he was uh you know a, a salesperson in his early days he was a club promoter at one point too um and his first few years were definitely rocky but he stayed motivated he stayed passionate you know he he um he got through all these challenges and and it's a testament to his to his character and a testament to his success you know he he um really persevered in in, in tough times and and the difference between him and the other brokers essentially is that they do persevere. Mm, they per- don't take no for an answer. They just keep going and keep chugging. And perseverance is the is the key, definitely. You know, especially like I said in that in that first twelve months where, a you know all, all, all the potential referral partners don't know who you are, and you know you got to prove them why why to they should refer to you. And b you've got to stay motivated when you might not be earning any money and you're actually working long hours. You know. Mm. Talk about social media. Obviously, when you started back in the Foxtel day, social media probably, probably wasn't a, yeah, a big definitely. thing, right? Like no. it would have been TV ads and radio and mm. less Facebook and Instagram. And now it's like the way you work out whether someone's good at anything is like mm. you look at their social profile and if they've got heaps of followers and mm. looks like they've got a track record, they, they perceive as doing really, really well. It's like your CV now is your, mm. is your social presence. Well, I indirectly probably used social to grow this business, but not you know, consciously, um, I, you know, every time we won awards and stuff, I was always sharing it on my Facebook and Instagram and, and, you know, um, gradually more and more people heard about what we we're doing and more and more of my close friends that were, you know, following me on Instagram was like, I hate my job. Can I come, come join? You know, um, initially in the first couple of years, it's literally all my best mates that were, that were working here. Um, that, that was the good old days. <laughs> we, we did say, um, back in our, you know, one of our first offices on, on Mount street, there was like, you know, 18 of us working there and uh, we're all best mates just um, you know working hard and, and achieving great results and we we said at the time we're we going to look back at this and think this is the good old days and uh, it was now they're all my competition <laughs> <laughs> yeah so and 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 is that something that you're happy with like you know competition I- I mean, I look at a lot of a lot of businesses. A lot of people come up underneath one person, and then they branch out. And I'm and I'm happy to see you know people grow and and um, mm-hmm. you know and and uh, reach their p- potential, um, as long as they do things amicably on their way out. You know, uh, if they respect um, you know what we've done for them, and you know if they respect what they've learned and achieved here at at, at Shaw, then yeah, I'm I'm happy I'm happy to see them prosper. Just got to make sure you're still the big dog and make sure they yeah, know. I've got to make sure I stay in front. You know? <laughs> <That's right. laughs> the, our numbers need to be a lot more than theirs. That's all that matters. That's, that is all that matters. Where uh, Shaw Financial now, like I said, is the biggest residential broker in, in Australia, independently owned. Mm-hmm. Where do you go to from here? If you're the biggest already, where, where's uh, well, where's the roadmap? So we're the biggest by distribution, um, but you know I feel like we could do uh, still lots of room for improvement. You know I'd love to digitize things. I'd love to slipstream the the process. I'd love to um, you know get get more of an online presence going in an informative way. You know you do some great informative content. Um, I think the best way to to create relationships with consumers is off the back of teaching them something. Right. So uh, we we want to try and really build an online uh, presence where we reach people in the first interaction online from educating them about something. Um, and then off the back of it, if, hey, they want to engage us for, for, for financial services, for a home loan or, or planning or, or, or something, 
great, you know, but at least we weren't selling them something in the in the in the first interaction. We were just giving them something for free. Value first. Mm. Gary Vaynerchuk talks about jab, 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 right hook, right? So you give, 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 and then ask. Yeah, Gary V's big on that. Yeah. He's huge. And then, you know, we were chatting the other day and, and property development like it is for myself is a huge um, interest in yours and, and something that you're super passionate about. Mm. Is that a space where you can see yourself moving into and we can have buildings side by side? Yeah, maybe. That sounds that sounds exciting. But um, yeah, property, is, it's always in the in the background. It's always a, 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 on, on the side of what I'm doing. You know, I'm always looking at even just coming down to your, your, your home, right? I always love finding a home that you can add value to and create to be your space, you know, and then and then and I haven't, like I said, I'm Greek, so I haven't sold yet, but- um, So you've never sold a property? I've never sold. <laughs> Ever? Uh, I've come close, so I almost had a panic attack, you know, about six months ago. Wow. Uh, luckily, a close friend of mine, Alex Phillips, sort of slapped me and pulled me in line and said, mate, what are you doing? Come on. And I was like, yeah, I'm going to be homeless if I sell. What am I doing? So- um, I haven't been down that that process, but um, yeah, you know, even just with your, your home, you know, creating a space, love that. Um, I, I haven't really gotten into to developments as such with multiple dwellings or anything like that, but I've done a few residential and, and commercial projects in, as a, you know, single dwelling or single premises in terms of office space. And are you going to c- continue with that, you think? Continue yeah, to build out the portfolio? Yeah, definitely. A hundred percent. Yeah. Is... Um Obviously, interest rates is a big topic at the moment. I think we, we should cover it before we, we wrap it up. How do you you know see that impact in the overall marketplace? You know, I think a lot of people are quite reactive with their decisions and they make sh- you know long term decisions based on short term metrics. And obviously, I'm sure you've seen in your career interest rates rise and interest rates decrease. And mm. one thing that stayed consistent throughout that is property prices have, mm. have continued to increase over the long term. How do you see that playing out with uh, the, the economic outlook that we have and you know, if you were a buyer right now, which probably sounds like you are in, in some aspect, how would you make the decision? I get asked this question all the time, even <laughs> even irrelevant to what's going on right now with interest rates. It's been a question every year, right? There's always something to, to, to say, hey, should I be waiting? You know, hey, um, you know, there's a, three years ago in t- 2019, there was a, another election going on and yeah. people were like, I should wait till after the election and actually some of the best buying was just before the election back then um, and the Royal Commission also just just back then was uh, making people concerned about whether they should be holding off because it might all fall apart after the Royal Commission there's always an excuse to think should I hold off and see what happens in, in 12 months time I think let go of all those factors let go of you know the economics of the property market and just find something that you actually want to buy because that's the hardest part right um, finding a property that that is a, a box ticker as such. Um, and I think the ideal property also doesn't tick every single box. The ideal property is the ideal amount of compromise. You can't you can't win, win them all. Even if, you, you, if your budget's 15, 20 million, I bet you the person who's buying that 15, 20 million dollar house is compromising in some way to their regard, right? To their situation. What They're probably feeling like, oh, the yard's not as big as I wanted. Or the, the views aren't as good. The, the views aren't as good. I wanted a three, four car carriage. I've got two, but I'll um, make it work. You know, first world problems. Yeah, first world problems. At, at every every sort of um, yeah, um, level, there's, there's still some level of compromise. 100%. So for yourself, like regardless of what's happening, it sounds like you'd still be yeah, bullish on buying have, the right property. Yeah, I'd be looking, finding that opportunity. In any market, there's also a, a good opportunity. So even in a, in, a, in a booming market like we saw in the last couple of years, I saw clients buy properties for, for good value. You know, they moved quickly because they could see the opportunity. They could re- recognize value by being in the market and looking at, at, at that many properties. They could say, hey, this one seems like good value. And they moved quickly before anyone else did, right? Um, you know, Back on the economics of things, yes, interest rates are rising. We saw our first interest rate rise um, this week. You know, for since first in twelve years, um, it was it was uh, off the back of last week's inflation result. Uh, do I think that's going to make a big impact to things? No, um, interest rates are going to rise another you know one and a half two percent over the next two years. You know, do I think that's going to make a big impact? It will definitely cool things down. I don't see a huge correction. I don't see you know the property market crashing. Um, you know, interest rates two, three years ago were one and a half, two percent higher, you know, and and the economy was fine. Probably what market. were they when you built your first property at 21? Do you remember? Or roughly? Yeah, I do. 6.8%. I remember you could fix in back then at like 7.2, 7.5. Right. Um, a good rate was about 6.8. Hence why I couldn't afford to live in my property. <laughs> I was in there for six months. I was like, wow, this is expensive. <laughs> These I interest rate things. I didn't know about also um, all the other costs, you know, I, 
back then, you know, being a young 21 year old. Like going to icebergs every Saturday, that's. <laughs> yeah, maybe <amazing. laughs> like that. But I, I didn't know about like, you know, the, the water rates, gas rates, council rates. I, I didn't know about all these other, other costs. I was like, wow, it's actually quite expensive to live in this house. And then reflecting back on it now, the first property that you bought, I'm not sure what it was, but it sounds like it was a house because you're opposed to apartments from, from the culture. Um, did you ever think it'd be worth what it is right now? And To be honest, my first property wasn't, you know, talking about mistakes. I don't think my first property was the best decision um, in, in, as, a, as a first property. I, I bought a, a, a cool renovated terrace. I was attracted to the, the shiny, um, you know, brand new terrace. You know, in hindsight, I wish I bought a property that um, needed some love and I could add value to. When sometimes when you buy the cool, brand new, shiny thing, the, the value's already been, you know, um, uh, utilized. You mm -hmm. know, someone's already uh, selling for a premium and selling it as a shiny, brand new item, you know, so. Uh, good good way to, to uh, show your friends off, but, you know. <laughs> yeah, I was, I was excited, right? I was yeah, like, yeah. how good, we can we can all um, come over here for dinner. I thought it was, I thought it was, I didn't. Didn't under, uh, underestimate it also what would go into No, I overestimated what would go into a, a renovation as well. And then, but looking back on it now, obviously you, you can reflect and say I could have bought something better, but mm. the overall performance of that property, I'm sure you're not kicking yourself going, oh shit, I could have made another 50 or 100 grand or it could have performed at 6% as opposed to whatever it I'll has. be honest, I do kick myself a little <laughs> bit. I'm not, not going to pretend I don't. I, I look at what I could have done. I could have, you know, I could have bought two small apartments, you know, two little one or two bedders and they probably would have outperformed the terrace, definitely. Um, you know, do I, does that keep me up uh, up at night? No. Yeah. But I, I definitely do analyse all my decisions like that and I, and I, I look at that property, I think, I, you know, what could I, what could I have done differently um, at that point in time? And I analyze these decisions to make the best decisions moving forward too, right? right? You know, I'm not going to buy the, the shiny brand new house again now. I, I, you know, my, um, the next property I want to buy would be a, a, a property that I can add value to, like I said. Right. So, so it sounds like the assets that you're targeting now are assets that are in good quality locations, wherever mm. that may be, assets that have all the fundamentals that people want, mm. but not an asset that you're paying a premium for because you're paying someone else's renovation. You want to create that value through a renovation 100%. to be able to manufacture growth. Especially right now, because right now everyone's quite hesitant on um, renovating with the big increase in building materials. And mm -hmm. you know, a lot of people don't you know, have the confidence to try and manage a builder through the process, which is hard. That's you know, I've had bad experiences with builders, definitely. I've also had great experiences with builders. And that just comes down to finding the right people that you can work with. Right, um, and 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 managing that process um, right, but um, so right now there's definitely an opportunity if you are willing to, to go down that process. The unrenovated properties are going for much better value than the renovated properties, definitely. 110. percent We hear it all the time from our clients as well. It's mm. like, oh, do I really want to do a renovation? I'm reading in the newspaper, prices are up 30 percent, and this could happen, and this could happen. Mm. Um, but like you said, if you buy the right property, the value is still there. And what I also love about it is that you can renovated property to exactly how you want it. If it's your home, you're not talking about an investment property. If it's your home, you, you know, if you want a, a kitchen a certain size, you want an integrated fridge, you, you know, you want, you want your air fryer or something integrated, <laughs> something like that, you could do all those crazy, wacky things, you yeah. know. Might limit the resale if it's something too crazy and wacky, but, you know, you can, you can design something the, the exact way you want it for your home, which, which is exciting. 100%. Just before we wrap up, I heard you, you you say then all the you know decisions you've potentially would have done differently, you've reflected back on, and, and the reason you do that is so you don't make those same division, decisions mm. moving forward. Um, bit of a on-the-spot question, but reflecting back on your life so far, other than buying the terrace and, mm. and not buying two smaller apartments, what's one of the big things that you reflect, reflect back on now and if you were to start the journey in 2022... Say so you're 19, you've just finished your fox, your fox doll door knocking apprenticeship and you're mm -hmm. about to jump into the marketplace. It's probably a little bit of a different world to what you know mm. you started in. Not not hugely, but a little bit. What would you do differently or what would what would the 19-year-old Theo do if he was kick-starting today and, and getting into the marketplace as a broker or as any other business it's owner? A, it's a tough question because I, I don't have too many regrets. I remember also you know a, a guy I looked up to back at um, that sales company, Smart Sales Marketing, um, I, I was dwelling on a regret back then. I can't remember what that was. It must have been really pathetic. <laughs> but um, I remember he, he he said to me, he's like, never ever dwell on you know the past and, and mistakes and regrets. You know, you know, just acknowledge your your mistakes and, and learn from them and move on. And so I don't have um, you know too many regrets as such. 
definitely, you know, like I said, mistakes I've 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 made, which we've you know learnt from, and, and and it's changed direction in the business. Um, you know, what would I what would I have done differently? I probably should have um, uh, invested more in, in digital and and learnt more in just that even the IT space. So I wish I wish I was more of an IT guy than I am. You know, so I could, look at this. Yeah, <laughs> this is the best I could do for IT, right? <laughs> Um, but yeah, I wish I was probably I had a bit more of a knowledge and understanding of of web development and whatnot. So you know, as we were building the business, we we're also building some some um, you know some tech and online presence and whatnot at the same time. Um, I wish I probably uh, had more support in terms of management from the start. Mm-hmm. We were always uh, spread quite thin at the start. Like I said, we had pretty much one ops manager for the first few years. Um, I wish we we uh, had more management support from from the get go. And that, like you said, that stuff you don't know until you're in it, right? You mm. think you can sort of do everything, but it's probably other people that are. Well, yeah, I'm saying that now, and but it, as I'm saying, I'm thinking actually, if I had a bigger management team back then, what would they have even done? <laughs> they probably would have, would have been sitting there because they didn't have much to work on. Right? You'd have been at lunch at Mimi's, and they just would have. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> these ones. So they would have been taking Mate, long lunches too. That's gold. I think there's a lot of gold in that. Um, so it sounds like your, your your outlook for the property market. There's still a lot of value to be had if you're buying the right assets. Mm, definitely, right now, yeah. If you were if you were starting a business in 2022, whether it be in the broking space or others, it would be to have a, a strong digital presence and definitely. I guess get an understanding of how everything works. Mm. So when you're growing the business, you haven't got people pulling the wool over your eyes and saying mm. you need this and this is how much it costs when you potentially don't. Exactly. And uh, made another big one was was don't dwell and and I guess you can look at your mistakes but learn from them, take from them and don't let them don't let them bring you down like don't dwell on something and, and make it you know make that affect your confidence and and drive for your next steps you know there's a I've, I've, even right now there's a lot of people in the team that are upset about things they, they they've done wrong maybe in building their business and I'm like don't, don't don't feel bad don't feel embarrassed you know the word embarrassed is is, is the worst word to use um, I'm like take that word out of your vocabulary you don't be embarrassed you tried it didn't work move on. And then you tell them a story about how old mate told you to get out of the auction, right? Yeah, yeah. I've used that story so many times. <laughs> Some of the more senior staff are like, "Come on, mate, you got to get." Another, add another notch. Sure, I heard that again. You got to get. You got to get rid of that story, <laughs> mate. That's gold. I really, really appreciate you coming on. I, le- I appreciate you letting us use your studio. Thank you. Thanks for for having me or hosting. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Cheers, mate.